As hunters, we love to watch them, yearn to learn more about them, even love the taste of them. But to experience that venison, you have to be able to hunt them. And that means knowing everything you can about the white-tailed deer and what makes them tick. Sex, food, and safety. That pretty much covers everything a white tail wants. Food, sex, and security. It sounds kind of familiar, really. Anyhow. I'm Steve Bartella. I'm Gordy Cron. I'm Mark Kaiser. I'm Dan Schmidt, and this is Deer and Deer Hunting TV. It plays out every fall. Hunters head to the woods, armed with the latest gear, the best tactics, the plan that's going to bring home that buck this season. But that plan has to start with the most basic knowledge. What makes a whitetail buck survive? Whitetail hunting, for the most part, the biggest challenge is hunting a new property. Or maybe a property you just don't have that personal feel with yet. I'm a DIY guy, so that happens to me a lot. But I tend to focus in on three things. Food, and that includes water. Refuge or sanctuary and sex, well, the does. But that is the leading part of the sex drive of a whitetail. You give them those big three right there, you're 90% of the way there. Now, all you gotta worry about is a little bit of a comfort factor, and you're good. Food, sex, safety, comfort, and water. You offer them the best of that than they can get in that entire area, and guess where the deer are gonna be? They're gonna be on you. That's why you see boom or bust populations or activity on certain properties. Because the guy who has the food has the deer, the guy next to him doesn't have the food, he doesn't have the deer, but his property now is, I say this a lot, is the low rent area. That's the low rent neighborhood. So that's where you get the pass through traffic for bucks during the rut. They're still gonna come through there, but they're not gonna come through there as often. You know, whatever is on his mind of those three things, uh, that's gonna determine where and how you, how you hunt them. Now food is kind of easy, really. Um, early in the season, late in the season. Those are the two times to target food sources. I love that first week of bow season. Deer are almost naive. They've been in this summer pattern for two months probably, coming to the same food sources. So that's where I'm gonna be. It's gonna be a short window. Um, you might get two, three days, you might get a week, and then the bucks are gonna figure that out. Same thing late season, food. Food is essential for them to start building up their bodies again to face the winter. So food is where I'm gonna be. These are late season food sources, uh, whether it's food plots, um, what's left of agricultural fields, things like that. But I'm gonna target food early in the season and late in the season. We can dictate whitetail movement to the whitetail world, at least to a great extent. How do you do that? By putting their primary food sources in the destinations you want them to go to. We can take it even a step further and back up. Rather than, rather than set up on that large clear cut, rather than set up on that large egg field, move back in the woods, oh, 50, 100 yards. Make yourself a little quarter to a half acre opening. You set that between bedding and that food and guess where the deer are gonna go? They're gonna parade right through your staging plot. You put up a whole bunch of licking branches, make a whole bunch of mock scrapes and you just not only have a staging plot for food, you've got a social hub that is going to attract the deer so they can keep tabs on each other. Deer and deer hunting is brought to you by Hornady. 
Accurate, deadly, dependable. Mossberg, built rugged, proudly American. Nikon, the next generation in hunting optics. Cuddyback, more deer, fewer blanks. And by Scent Killer Gold with Hunt Dry Technology. Apply, dry it, and go hunt. Coming up next. Now, if you have to rank these three things, food, refuge, or sex, the rut, which one do you rank the highest? You're watching Deer and Deer Hunting TV. This segment of Deer and Deer Hunting is brought to you by Matthews. Knowing what makes a whitetail buck tick really comes down to three things, sex, food, and safety. That means if you want success in the fall, start looking where those bucks can get all three. So let's start with sex, mainly because it's the sexiest topic we got here. I don't manage ground for myself or my clients for bucks. I manage my ground for does. Specifically, what I want is I want healthy, well-structured family groups, and I'm gonna go ahead and try to stick them around the food in areas that they are not gonna bust me coming in and going out, but leaving that backside alone for bucks. When you construct those bedding areas in locations that work for you, you know what? Sex is good in every way you can imagine. Obviously, during the rut, what's on a buck's mind? Does. Okay, food still comes into play here because you need to target does in order to find the bucks. So if the does are on the food sources, uh, that's where the bucks are gonna be too. So you've got two things going on here. You've got food and you've got procreation. So now you've got the sex, you've got the food, you've got the safety. All we need is the deer. 25 years of deer habitat management allows for a little time to enjoy the fruits. Steve has the chance to bow hunt the habitat he's worked so hard to create. Shortly after getting in his stand, all that hard work pays off. In early October, I was out hunting a different buck on this remote food source when he showed up and frankly gave me an absolutely gift-wrapped 15-yard quartering away, head down shot opportunity. I thought about it quite seriously, but I ultimately decided to pass. I decided to pass because it was still early in the season and there was another buck that I just had my heart set on. Then I went back in there to actually try to kill him. And you know what? I blew the shot. I missed completely. So after that, one probably wouldn't think that this guy is so easily killable you'd be wrong when he came back out the very first thing he did is he went around that food plot and he nosed every single doe there was then he stopped and fed a little bit that's one of the myths about rutting bucks that they don't eat sure they do they just don't go out of their way to eat as much as they do earlier in the season and afterwards so he went ahead he got something to eat after getting something to eat knowing that the does that were right in front of him weren't weren't in estrus, he went ahead and was circling the plot to scent check it. When he came within range, and I was able to make the shot. It's hard to put into words the, the feelings when I was walking up on this deer. Here is a five and a half year old, 150 inch bruiser. To have it all come together, you know, frankly, it was an exceptionally rewarding feeling. And a big part of the rewarding feeling was the fact that I had made these improvements. He followed the script. And that is a key. When you lay out a solid habitat improvement plan, whether it's on Utopia or that 40 acres that's surrounded by meat hunters, when you lay out that plan and it comes to fruition, it is hard to explain the feeling of satisfaction from everything coming together, and that is exactly what I felt. Coming up next, when you hit on all three of a buck's desires, does that guarantee success? You're watching Deer and Deer Hunting TV. White-tailed deer are survivors. You don't last that long as a hunted animal without knowing what it takes to stay alive. You can try to pattern them, 
get a feel for their travel patterns, or think you know exactly when and where they will appear. But it really comes down to being aware of three factors, sex, food, and safety. Now, if you have to rank these three things, which one do you rank the highest? Well, it kind of depends on where you're hunting and the time of the year, obviously. If the rut is roaring and there's bucks running everywhere, you probably better take advantage of that as opposed to sitting on an acorn plot. But if it's a level playing field and you are coming onto a property for the first time or, or getting ready to hunt it that first season, I tend to go towards sanctuary and refuge first. Why? Well, my goal generally is to hunt a mature deer, an older deer, at least a four and a half year old deer, if not a five and a half year old. That's my preference. Doesn't always happen that way. And what are those deer gonna use the most? Well, they're gonna use food. They're gonna have that sex drive. And I, oh, that comes in second, by the way. But they are definitely gonna rely on refuge and sanctuary. That's how they got that old. They didn't do that just by running around all over. They did it by utilizing cover, going to that refuge and sticking in sanctuary hideouts until it got dark enough to go out onto those food plots where a lot of you capture those great images of big bucks, but it's at midnight. Those deer though are slinking around those sanctuary zones during shooting light. The big question you have to ask yourself, do you go into these sanctuary zones or stay on the perimeter? Well, for me, I kind of do a little bit of both. You can't stay on the perimeter of many sanctuary zones or you're just simply hunting a field edge. Instead, you need to go in a few yards, but you don't want to invade the bedroom. If a deer is in his bed and he sees you in the bedroom, that could ruin that area. He may go to a different bedding or sanctuary area. For Mark Kaiser, that security system is a huge sunflower field in central South Dakota. To keep from getting busted is a huge challenge, one that a seasoned hunter like Mark is up for any time. This hunt, I was hunting in a standing sunflower field. Deer were feeding adjacent to the sunflower field in several different other crops. That meant the deer were leaving that sunflower field at some point during the late day and returning, you know, early to mid morning. What I needed to do to get in there was to beat the deer in in the morning before they got in. So I went in extra early. And I always prayed for a little bit of wind to cover my noise as I went down the road. And in the afternoons, I simply just took a little longer nap after shooting light to make sure all the deer left and got out onto the field. That way I wasn't creating any type of ruckus and bumping into any deer that were still transitioning from the refuge of the standing sunflower field to the adjacent food source. That's when I really needed to make sure I had sprayed down, was wearing my rubber boots and not touching any vegetation. And especially when I put my decoy out. I love decoy hunting and I don't hardly hunt without it. So I was stashing my decoy at the ambush site so I didn't have to go in and out rattling, making a lot more noise. And when I got there, I tiptoed through the brush, put my decoy out, careful not to touch any standing vegetation, and then back up in the tree. Using these key invisibility factors and all the descenting that I did prior to the actual hunt, it helped me get in on this sunflower buck, and this was some of the most exciting action I had had in a long time. But eventually, a cold front moved in. The winds picked up, a little bit of snow was in the air, and that's what I like. Deer being pressured to feed because they know the weather's changing. Doe started spilling out into this opening, browsing on their way out of the sunflowers, and I knew sooner or later a buck would likely follow. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a flash. I put up my Nikons, and there was a buck charging those does. Well, they had dispersed, and he was scent trailing them right past my stand. The funny thing is, he was so immersed in the scent of the doe, he didn't even see my buck decoy. And as he got up broadside to me, he was booking it. I didn't even know if I was gonna get a shot, when suddenly, he hit the brakes, and I knew he had seen my plastic friend. 
I drew back, got ready to shoot, and he was still moving at just a little bit of a gait as he was watching that buck on the edge of the sunflowers. But I let my arrow fly, and that was a wrap. A buck rolled in sight of my stand. Don't you just love that when you see the deer go down? There's none of this nervousness. Oh man, I got a blood trail. There's no blood trail in there. It's all horn laying in the sunflower. Staying invisible, it was key to this hunt. Trying not to make noise going through the sunflowers. Trying to evade the deer and not bumping into them when they were moving and being scent free as I put my decoy out. It all played a factor. A little bit of sweat equity to get the job done, but it's worth it when you can wrap your hands on antlers like those. Up next, what you should be doing right now to get ready for the season and the latest cool gear to help in your scouting. This is Deer and Deer Hunting TV. Deer and Deer Hunting is brought to you by Thompson Center, America's master gun makers. Analogix, protect your herd with the power of science. Get armed and deadly with Easton's FMJ arrows. And by 10 Point Crossbow Technologies, there is no substitute. On the surface, one most people are going to say we can't control whether a deer feels safe or not on our ground. Well, A, if you're a private landowner, baloney, even if it's just 20 acres, you can make it so that your 20 acres, the deer feel safe there. How do you do that? You don't let them know you're hunting them. That doesn't mean you don't hunt them hard. Heck, you can hunt them hard as heck as long as you put the upfront thought into. Before you go do any of this stuff, sit down, ask yourself what your goals are. Be honest about what those goals are and now cater a plan specifically to try to achieve them and then go out, manipulate the habitat, put what's, what the deer are doing that's working towards your goals, put that on steroids by enhancing it. You take that approach and now you have a logic, a logic to hunting your property and in the case of that 20 acres, well, Go ahead and make yourself edge, edge access on that 20 acres. Make it so that whenever you're going to a stand, your wind is blowing into the neighbors. You do that, you manufacture those high odds, low impact stand locations. You can hunt that 20 acres hard and the deer feel safe there. Trail cameras are a great scouting tool. But if you check them too often, they can lead to one obstacle and even a bigger problem. First, the obstacle, it takes time. And if you've got two, three, four, maybe more cameras out there, it could take you up to an hour to check them. And get this, that's an hour you're spending in the woods with your deer. The big problem is that checking trail cameras too often can leave human scent behind and spook deer, maybe even push them off your property. What's the point of using trail cams if they chase your deer away? It's no wonder many hunters want cell phone equipped trail cameras. But check out the price. These cameras can cost two or three times more than models without the cell service. And then there's the monthly fee. It might be 10, 20, $30 per month per camera. It's no wonder that a lot of hunters are shying away from cell cameras. Sure, you might be able to justify buying one, but what good is that gonna do you? It, it'd be like hunting with one bullet or one arrow on uh, one acre of land. So what you want is this, right? You want the ability to use cameras without spooking deer, you want to be able to check them as often as possible, maybe every day often, and you want them to be affordable. Okay, so this is the Cuddy Link home camera, right? Yes, Gordy, this is the home camera. I've got it mounted on this tree right next to the gate where I drive in. Okay. The advantage of this is I can check all of my trail cameras before I even enter my hunting property, before I even get suited up. Cuddy Link is not cell, it's not Wi Fi, it's a proprietary wireless mesh network. You deploy the cameras and the remote cameras communicate and send images to one home camera. Cuddy Link can connect on a 40 acre parcel or even 2,000 acres. The cameras talk to each other, work out a path to send images home. 
Okay, I've read the literature. It's 15 cameras, up to 15 cameras, right? Up to 15 cameras plus Amazing. this. So a total of 16 cameras um, can be taken images, and all those images will be collected on this one camera's SD card. Okay, how do you identify which images came from which camera when you pull that card out? That... The, the, cam the images are saved on the SD card in a new folder we created called 400 Cuddy. Within this 400 Cuddy folder is separate folders for each camera. Okay. So therefore, the camera automatically sorts all the images into folders, making it easier to identify where those images came from. And you can physically go in and name those folders then too? The folders get automatically named based kind of location ID number the user assigns to the camera. Okay. So I assign location one to the home, location two to the next remote, location three to the third, and so on. And in this particular example, I got eight cameras out here. So I'll have folders location one through location eight. And in those folders will be the images from these cameras. They're all very simple, very intuitive when you look at your SD card. Furthermore, all Cuddyback cameras, even the non-Cuddyleak ones, allow the user to program a camera identification string into the camera that's printed right on the image. So now when a guy looks at the image, the name where that camera is can be, can be seen. For example, I have cameras named Bobcat Pass, Miller Park, Vision Field, things like that. Um, so now I, very, very easy to keep track. And with eight images, it's kind of hard to, yeah, oh, where did this yeah, picture yeah. come from? Well, it's location three, Tamarack Road. So now we're gonna pull the card, pull the new one in, she's ready to go again, and we can go back and we can view the images from your eight cameras. Put it back up, and now instead of walking out in the woods and checking eight cameras, we check them all in just a few minutes.